all for, for coming out. And it's, it's wonderful to be back in Yellowknife. I, this is my fourth time here, first time, no, third time here was, was, was many years ago as just to drive up the road when it was still gravel. I never imagined I'd be standing in the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories actually lecturing. <laughs> what were the odds? In any case, um, as you've just heard, I've been coming north for the past five or six years to work with the, what was the Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute on what we call the Gwich'in Ethnoastronomy Project. Over the next half hour or so, I'd like to talk to you about the first fruits of this project, which is a work that is uh, nearing, the research stage is nearing completion, and that's an uh, examination of the place of the narrative of the boy and the moon in Gwich'in tradition. In the first 10 or 15 minutes, I'll try and give you some background of what we've been doing over the past few years in our study of the boy and the moon, and then move on to telling you a version of the story, and I have to say it will be a, my own personal version of the story. I'll be the storyteller tonight. Um, I've heard the story many times. I've been honored to hear the story many times from, from Gwich'in elders, both in my presence and on tape and in writing. And the story varies from person to person, from community to community, from time to time, even among the same elders. And one of the challenges in putting the material together and eventually trying to publish it and return the knowledge to the community will be to find a way to honor each of the different versions in the appropriate manner. So just for some, my own housekeeping, to remind those of you who are not familiar with the northern part of the Northwest Territories, um, what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the four communities that you see on the map here. Um, Aklavik, Inuvik, but especially Sigachik and Fort McPherson. M our, we've conducted an, um, ethnographic research in each of these communities and library research in, in um, Inuvik particularly, as well as in Dawson City and Whitehorse, and now Yellowknife here. And we've also been working with the elders in the Yukon Territory in Old Crow. So, how did I end up getting here? Well, this is what I'm usually studying. This is a map of the ancient Near East. We can see here where my home is, over here in what's now Israel. And I'm usually studying this area here in Babylonia, which is today's Iraq. And what, what happened basically was about 10, 15 years ago, I began to be frustrated that all I could study were cuneiform tablets. This is my usual material. This is a very, very important, unique astronomical tablet from Yale University and ultimately from Uruk, from biblical Erech, which is right next to, to Ur, where Abraham, we're told, comes from. And this is what I'm usually studying. And here you can, oh, I didn't put that one in. So anyway, that's what I'm usually studying. But as I don't have anyone to talk to because all the people, scribes who wrote these tablets are no longer with us. And this language and this writing system have been dead for over 2,000 years. So I was interested in how does a astronomy work, when a living astronomy, how does stories and and observations interact. And so I remembered that when I was 13 or 14 years old, my parents took me up the Alaska Highway before it was paved. And that's what it, it looked like. Um, it was actually worse than the Dempster was this summer. So to give you an idea of, think of like a highway twice as long as the Dempster that you had to go up with four children in the back of a station wagon. That was what my parents did. And I fell in love with this part of the world. And when it was time to think about looking for a, a living tradition, I was fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Halbert Center for Canadian Studies in Israel at in Jerusalem and was able to come to Inuvik where through a long series of happenstances, coincidences, cosmic, well, what's the right word? There's a, there's a word for it um, when all the tumblers line up. I met Ingrid and her colleague, Alistine Andre, from the um, G 
GSCI, and we've been working together to put this material together. Anyway, to make a long story true, part of my dream is actually happening right now that I'm getting to not only be a professional Assyriologist, but I'm getting to play ethno-astronomer in northern Canada. So you, today you will be my playmates. And what we're going to talk about is the story of the boy in the moon. And many of versions of the boy in the moon story have circulated. It's an oral tradition going back who knows how long. One informant, one elder told, writes in some of the material that it's at least 20,000 years ago. But our documentation for the tradition only goes back to uh, first con to time of, of, of first contacts between European Canadians and the, the Gwich'in. The earliest surviving version comes to us from the 19th century. Um, the, we have, in terms of written evidence, we have in um, Hardesty of Hudson Bay Company in 1866 in notes of the Tinna or Chippewa Indians in British and Russian North America. And he gives a, a little bit of a summary of the Boy in the Moon story. And we also have a French version, which of course has been translated by uh, Emile Petito in 1886, who a uh, Catholic oblate missionary who lived in the Mackenzie Delta and actually compiled the first modern dictionary of the Gwich'in language, published in 1876. Moving on into the 20th century, we have a series of Gwich'in elders telling the story to, um, to ethnographers. For example, um, Cornelius Osgood and his 1970s contribution to the ethnography of the Kuchin. And we also, as we move along, we also have uh, today a number of um, our anthropologists and ethnographers who are working specifically on astronomy. And I should say thank you to Christopher Cannon from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a PhD student there who's made tremendous progress in documenting Gwich and stellar astronomy. Um, to all these types of people, one can add Dr. Elizabeth Cass, who was an opt ophthalmologist in Canada's Indian Health Service in Old Crow in the Northwest Territories in the 50s and into the 60s or just the 50s? But anyway, in the 50s. And toward the last, um, over the last decades, the, the knowledge has no longer been collected by outsiders, but it's been collected by the GSCI and by the local people in, in, in part of their own heritage in Dawson and um, Old Crow in the Yukon. And so what we have is, is a living tradition which goes back 150 years and what we've been able to establish as we've looked at this material for the last five years is that what we're looking at today has a chain of evidence which can bring us back to the time of first contact in the 1860s when we hear about this material for the first time in English in, in uh, Ross and Hardesty and the first time we hear about it in French in, in Petito. I've had the honor of hearing it told twice to me, both in English and in Gwich'in by Mary Effie Snowshoe of Fort McPherson in February of 2015, and by my friend George Semple of Aklavik, whose grandfather Johnny Semple will talk about, and this link of father, of grandfather to grandson is an important aspect of the story. So without further ado, the boy in the moon, and this is part of um, Johnny Samples, the grandfather's um, account of the boy in the moon, as told to Elizabeth Cass, the um, ophthalmologist. Okay, so a long time ago, maybe 20,000 years ago, there was a very hard winter. There was very little food and the people were going hungry. And as the winter progressed, no meat was found by the hunters and the people began to worry and the men got together to organize a caribou hunt. Um, this winter, there was a little boy living in camp. He was living with an older couple who had not before had any children, and different versions disagree. Some, in some versions, he's their natural child who was born late in life to this couple. In other versions, he's a child that was somehow found or adopted by the couple. But in any case, they were raising this ch young child, very young child, um, really a baby um, as their own. But he was a special baby because he was able already to walk and talk, and his name was Suk, which means Martin in Gwich'in. And when he heard that 
the men were going out to find the caribou, he asked if he could come along and hunt. And the mother and father had some discussion and they finally agreed, even though the men were a bit skeptical because this young boy, this near baby, was so small that his mother could make him a hunting outfit from the skin of just one single marten. So the men started on the trail and they couldn't find any caribou. And the little boy said that he knew where they could be found. The hunters ignored him. And they finally became desperate enough to say, okay, little boy, where are the caribou? And he told them, I will tell you where the caribou are, but you have to promise me that you will give me the choice of the best and fattest caribou that I can give to the poor and the orphans and the other people in the community who don't have a reliable hunter who hunts for their food supply. And this is, I think, underlying these stories are these very important core values of sharing, sharing food, sharing knowledge, working together to, for the community. And of course, the boy leads them and he's successful and they find the caribou. Um, in some versions, he builds a caribou fence or he teaches them to build a caribou fence. In some versions, he's a shaman and actually conjures up a vision of caribou and, and knows where they are. So there's many, there's many different variations on the different parts of the story, but the basic line, the basic tradition is the same, but it kind of like wiggles back and forth. So, um, when the hunt was over, the boy looked around and chose his caribou, but he didn't get it because the mean uncle had brought down the best caribou and the mean uncle was not willing to give the caribou to the little boy. And the little boy started to cry and he cried and cried and cried all night. And this enraged the uncle who couldn't sleep and said, send him to the moon. Well, when they woke up the next morning, the little boy was gone. They looked and looked but couldn't find him and that night he appeared in the face of the moon. And you can see him. Even today, he's right over here. Here's his head, and here's his body. So, his parents now cried. And the next morning when they woke up, he was back. And he said to them, you will live only for a little while, but I will live forever. When you see me hunched over with a full pack sack, this means that I'm carrying plenty of meat, and there will be much meat to eat this winter, but if I'm standing straight, this means my pack sack is empty and there'll be hunger among the people and you should take precautions. And the little boy told his parents that in the future they should look at the moon and see its signs. And if the moon was facing one way, this means they should rejoice. There'll be a good winter. And of course, the people rejoiced. Um, and one version of the story reads, whenever there is lots of caribou with you, tell the people to sing, happy dance, and feast, and have a good time. So the story is not just a narrative, it's involved in some kind of action that's expected of the people. In a good winter, they are to sing, be happy, dance, and feast. So already we're moving from the realm of story into the realm of ritual, into the realm of myth and mysticism. Now, it's, there's lots of variations and it's not quite clear what it means if your pack is full and pack is empty. I've always imagined that if the moon is kind of like this, this I think would be good because he's being pulled back. And if he's straight, that would mean that he's standing straight but I've not been able to get anyone to confirm that. And of course, if anyone has any knowledge, and please don't be embarrassed to point out um, that the emperor's wearing no clothes, but that I don't know this particular piece because there is so many variations and there is so much knowledge out there and it's really a question of trying to bring everything together. In any case, that night, the boy disappeared again and the next morning he was gone, his little dog was gone and most of his Martin suit was gone. Only a pant leg was still stuck in the smoke hole of his parents' house. And here you can see a smoke hole from a drawing by Murray in, of a traditional house from um, 
circa 1850. Well, in another version, he tells the people to be, oh, sorry, in, in almost all the versions, he tells his parents to make sure that they have some meat available for themselves and sometimes for the whole village, but always the meat uncle doesn't get anything to eat. And there are many, many stories that involve the blood of the caribou, which can be used to make caribou blood soup. Most stories agree, but not all of them, that since the day that the boy disappeared for the last time, oops, you can see in the moon, the boy, his puppy, sometimes this is the puppy, there are those who see this as the puppy. There's another little blotch over here in some pictures, and that's sometimes two puppies. And the pack sack is usually this, but sometimes this seems to be the pack sack. So there's not complete agreement on which element on the moon is which element. But the really nice thing is, look at the legs. Nice big fat leg, skinny leg. Well, it always seemed to me that why did the boys pant leg get stuck in the top of the traditional house. Well, obviously, because he's, here he has his pants on, and here he doesn't. And in the last year or so, we found two different versions that talk about the boy missing only one pant leg, which got stuck in the house. So, in any case, by looking at these images, one can predict what kind of winter is to be expected, a happy winter of food and celebration, or a harsh winter of starvation. And that's just my version of the story, one of many that I've heard over the past few years, and actually one of many that I've told. Each time I tell it, it's also different. So, um, let's now take a look at the, the versions of the story, which I have passed that you should all have a copy of this, or at least access to a copy of this. And I'll start by saying that there seem to be three different groups of versions of the story. One of these I call a white moon tradition, or full moon tradition. And this is basically what you see here. Many of the stories clearly imply that there is a full moon. And this seems to be tied to the fall equinox. However, there are also red moon stories, what I call red moon stories. And these seem to be tied to eclipse traditions. When the moon is eclipsed, it can only happen at the time of a full moon, and the moon turns red. And this becomes connected in the various versions with the caribou blood. But we've also been able to discover a black moon version, where the boy is in, seen in black, on the face of the moon. And this, I think, refers to those times at the beginning of the month when there is just the, new, the crescent of the new moon, or the end of the month, the crescent of the old moon would be on the other side, and you can see the rest of the moon illuminated by the crescent. So, let's now take a look at some of the written documentation. Uh, the first is from Johnny and Sarah Frank from the Gritchen Communities in Alaska. And they say, um, this is three generations ago, when the moon rises and sets upside down, you see that means there will be no food. But when it sets right side up, you see that means there'll be plenty of food. I I'm not quite sure whether it means right side up and upside down, but that would seem to imply this kind of black moon tradition where you have a crescent moon. When the moves this way, they would pack a little food and go to each other's houses with a stick and sing. But I don't know the song for it. When they went from house to house, they did it thinking they'll be lucky to get food. But I don't remember the song that went with it. So here you have people going from house to house, tied with the narrative of the boy in the moon, singing and hopefully getting some kind of food. And immediately this triggered my own childhood and visions of Halloween, of going from house to house and getting candies. Now you move forward two generations. Kenneth Frank is now reporting what he's been told in his family. In the early days, they used to have a ceremony with the moon, this, it's stuff like that, but there was, 
But there where the story was, the little boy went into the moon, and that little boy, he said in the heart, um, part of this is, is my um, computer not picking up the typing exactly, and part of it's probably my mistake, so I apologize. The little boy said, there will be hardship of the people. He said, in the future, I will give your generation, in the future generation, I'll give them a sign for everything. You know, for like weather hardship, weather hardship, starvation, more of those things, you know, like that. So that's why even today, if you look at the sun and the moon, it will give you a sign, and so on and so on. Um, so th the moon and the sun are also not only involved with the, the boy and the moon, but they're involved in giving signs, telling the future, weather, climate, and so on, which is also part of the boy and the moon tradition. Here's one from Dr. Elizabeth Kest. The, the shoe and the hairs have mentioned that when one goes into mountains at Easter time, one can see the sun dancing. So now we're talking about Easter, and now we're in the spring, around the time of the spring equinox. She continues, there must be some special atmospheric phenomena causing the sun to be bobbing up and down. Franklin Indians danced and sang their religious song to the boy in the moon when the sun danced. So here we are at the time of Easter, at the spring equinox, and we have the boy and the moon connected with sun. So it's not just the moon, it's the moon, it's the sun, it's part of the whole system, and again, it's involved with singing and dancing. Effie Linkletter from Old Crow on the Yukon. Here, he's quoting the boy and the moon. Whenever you see the moon on its back, and during eclipse, it will be a good winter. There'll be lots of caribou, you will live well. But when the moon looks down, then you will have a very cold winter and starvation too. He then told his parents, this is the boy in the moon speaking, whenever there is lots of caribou with you, tell the people to sing, be happy, dance and feast and have a good time. Then always I will look down on you. So again, we have this celebration that's part and parcel of the boy in the moon tradition. So it's the story, but the story is involved with many other different layers of tradition. And Fort McPherson, this is why people dance when there is an eclipse of the moon, because Moon Boy helped them one time long ago. The eclipse is a promise from Moon Boy that the people will have a good year. If you look carefully, you can still see Moon Boy wearing his Martin pants and holding his bag of blood. And there's his Martin pants. And sometimes this is a bag of blood, sometimes it's a bucket of blood. Johnny Semple from a club, oh sorry, David Salmon from Alaska. It has to do with Eclipse, they have a song for it, and I forgot the song, and they carry the pack, you know. Johnny Semple, the boy in the moon again speaking. I will be on the moon as long as there is a moon and stars in the sky. When it's a good winter with plenty of meat, always remember my song and be happy. Dance and make a feast and be thankful for the meat. I will always be watching down on everyone. Then the boy in the moon took a little bag of caribou blood and a small dog, dog with him and disappeared. Well, we now know that the boy in the moon is looking down and is involved in hunting. We have informants who tell us that um, when the hunters were having trouble finding caribou, they could pray to the boy in the moon. I would imagine this is because the boy in the moon in the moon could see where the caribou were, but that is something that has not been directly confirmed yet. Um, he then goes on, in those days the Lashu Indians made a soup of blood like the blood wine that is used in churches. They depended on the blood of soup and sang the religious song. So now we have a ritual, a song, and feast, and the narrative. Lazarus Sitin Chinli, when the new moon appears, if you see me with my pack sack full, I'll be leaning back. When you see me like that, be happy and sing and dance among yourselves. It will be a good winter with plenty of meat. Paul Solomon, as told to Robert McKinnon in the first part of the 20th century, uh, middle of the 20th century, after leaving instructions for the ceremony, which is still celebrated in his honor, whenever the moon is in an eclipse, Sheshahaji, the boy in the moon, disappeared. So, the informant here had actually seen these festivals taking place. 1867. In consequence of their having refused him a piece of fat when he asked them, all animals would in future be lean in winter and fat only in summer. So now we know why 
hunting, it, the rhythm of the hunting year of fat animals in summer and lean animals in winter is also now tied directly into the boy in the moon narrative. Since then he has continued to live in the moon and is ever ready to answer the prayers of the hunter who demands his aid before going on a hunting expedition. So the boy in the moon has a direct connection, direct connection, direct relationship with the hunters. When they go out hunting, they can pray to him for help in finding their animals. Gritchen words about the land. People say to this day on bright nights, they can see the boy standing on the moon with the caribou fat in one hand and the dog by his side. And finally, the song from old crow stories from the Yukon. When the moon eclipses backwards, each person should be happy and carry a little bag of food around with them and give food to the old people and the helpless. So it's not Halloween where the children are getting food, but the children are wandering around the community and bringing food to elderly people and people in need. And everyone should sing during this time as follows. I am going to drink caribou blood, I am going to drink caribou blood. On a clear night you can see the boy in the moon holding a piece of the caribou blood in his right hand. So, if he's facing this way, then I guess that blotch is the caribou blood in the bucket. And finally we have some words, more words from the song from Johnny Semple. The shrew mouse jumps this way and back, I drink blood, I drink blood here worshiping the boy in the moon. And Johnny Semple said that in this song, shrew mouse means caribou. And this is quoted for us by Elizabeth Cass. And I'd like to conclude with now, oh, here you can see some dancing, oh, is a version of the song. Yeah. So anyway, that's the song, and we now have at least three versions of the song. Uh, and um, the highlight of this trip was going to a Klavik and sitting with George Semple, the grandson of Johnny Semple, who gave us the words to the song that you have here. Um, the shrew mouse jumps this way and that, I drink blood, I drink blood, here worshiping the boy who lives on the moon. Um, George Semple was in near tears and we were in near tears and he said that's the song I heard from my grandfather. So we're now able to um, confirm that the story and the song and the whole package goes together was part of a living tradition three generations ago and that would then, if you then take a young the young George Semple then would have had heard it from his grandfather, and his grandfather would have heard it from his grandfather, and that brings us back to the time of contact in the 1850s and the 1860s, when the story is first reported by Hardesty and Petito. And so we're able to now tie together the 150 years of recorded history of the boy in the moon. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Here you have a nice picture of what every single school child in the Mackenzie Delta believes is the Gwich'in boy in the moon. Here's the boy, he's holding something in his hand, and here's an animal, obviously his dog. But it's not. This is a Babylonian picture of what you see in the face of the moon. This is their hero, who is the, their king of the gods or the prince of the gods. He's holding some kind of weapon and this 
animal here is some kind of ormachlilu in Babylonian, a lion creature. Head of a lion, face of an eagle, body, that type of creature. Half lion, half man in some stories. And what's amazing is that the boy in the moon and the Babylonian hero in the moon are essentially the same picture because the Babylonians are actually drawing it from the point of view of being above the sky looking down. Whereas the boy in the moon in Gwich'in tradition is from the earth looking up. So it's just simply a little bit of a mirror image. So you see the same thing. You have the same three elements, some kind of hero, an object associated with the hero, and an animal associated with a story having to do with the hero. Now, remember that tablet I showed you before from Yale? Well, this is one of a group of five tablets that belong to this group. Not this particular tablet, but there's another little fragment from also from about 2,500 years ago, which describes the battle between that hero and the lion man in the context of various constellations that are around the same place in the, in the sky. So what we ended up hap happening is we had a Babylonian picture which informed on a Gwich'in story which then informed on the way that Gwich'in saw the moon, which then informed on the Babylonian picture, which then informed and helped us identify the story in a Babylonian text. So we've been able to not only move in terms of time and tradition within the 150 years of Gwich'in tradition, but we've been able to now move this whole pattern 2,500, this whole sort of composite story 2,500 years from the Gwich'in in the 19th and 20th century, 21st century now, of course, back into the Babylonians 500 or so uh, BC. Yes, the Boy in the Moon is a story about hunting and about um, values, but it's, it's really, I think, in many ways, the core tradition that was of the Gwich'in people prior to the contact with Western civilization and Christianity because a consistent pattern within the ethnographic documentation is oh, the boy in the moon is consistently identified with the Judeo-Christian God, with Jesus, and so on. And so the face, the picture in the moon is the central religious figure. And I think the boy in the moon will prove to be the central religious I can't think of a right word, package maybe, of the, the, the Gwich'in, and not only the Gwich'in, the Boy in the Moon story is known throughout the, by the Dene people of the, the Northwest Territories, and onwards there's um, even yesterday, we ha we, um, from Fort Liard, we had someone send us a, a, an email that they, in response to the hearing about this lecture, that they too in their family have um, a boy in the moon tradition and it's documented elsewhere and traditions which are allied to the boy in the moon even go down as far south as the um, Navajo in Arizona and New Mexico and the United States who are also part of the Dene Nation. The, the, the answer to the question got kind of mixed lost in there but the Babylonian picture is of the Babylonian king of the gods and, and it has to do with the mystical tradition and the values that of the Babylon, the core Babylonian religious system. So it's, it's really a question of, I wouldn't say borrowing, I, I don't know, I, I, that would be very hard to prove, but there really is a question of the, the moon being a very powerful symbol and the symbols of the moon being very much at the core of the religious tradition, religious message, as well as the actual rites and, and, and really mystical rites of the, um, the, um, the, the, the Gwich'in religious tradition. And I don't think it's accidental that the whole issue of blood also comes up in some of the early documentation um, that the, the oh, I wish I could, I can't pull it out of my memory and I don't remember which, in, which, which elder told us this and to who he was speaking, but I think it's, 
in the, it, it may be in the Elizabeth Cass material with Johnny Semple, that the, the priest wanted them to, st to stop eating, no, it had to be with Petitot, because it has to be Catholic right, that the priest wanted them to stop doing the boy in the moon because it was sacrilegious to drink caribou blood because it had to be, um, I don't have it here. It, that it, it somehow gets involved in the, in the Eucharist, in the, in the blood of, of Christ and Catholic rite, and somehow it was sensed to interfere. And part of the reason that this story, that the, the meaning of the story and its context may have been so hidden over the years is because it was so powerful and was perhaps um, hidden in some way on purpose. It was allowed to survive as a story, but its context has been really lost over the last 100, 150 years. Certainly with this song, um, its, it's identification and recognition is, is absolutely new. It's really um, only in the, only really this, this discussion of, of two or three weeks ago with Johnny Semple, were we able to finally totally confirm that the, that the Boy in the Moon song was indeed the, the song that he heard from his grandfather, which of course he then would have heard from his grandfather, which is what Hardesty and Ross and Petito and McDonald and all the other early um, churchmen and had heard. And it's, I, I, I'm not answering your question, I realize that, and I can't answer it because it's, it's, the material's too new, but, but I can tell you that the aim of our project is to give this knowledge back to the community. And we do have the tape, and people are trying to revitalize the, the language, and hopefully this will, will bring out more bits and pieces, and it's, it's really like a jigsaw puzzle. And we have, we have more pieces than we used to have, but we certainly don't have a full puzzle yet, and uh, hopefully whatever we do end up with will be enough that people, that the grandchildren and great-grandchildren will know the song, and by them singing it then triggers the memories of the grandparents. You get into these really nice cycles, but it is that, grand, that, that generation jump that seems to be happening with this material. There is some versions which, which also sort of turned up on this trip, um, that the reason that, that, that the monthly cycle of the moon happens because the boy is walking in this direction and the light continues with him, pulling the light with him until he gets to the other side of the moon and then it goes dark and then it comes back around again. So that creates the phases of the moon. And because it's blood, this is tied to menstruation, which is why women's menstrual period is one month. So that's, that's in this whole package as well. But no, there's never a, 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 never a girl on the moon, I guess. W women's lib has not come to the <laughs> Gretchen moon yet. <laughs> no, it's... it's um, there are, there's tremendous amount of information of signs um, of the moon looks, the, the geese flying south means this, just doing that means that. There's a whole list of um, omens that have been um, taken and recorded over the years. And many of them involve the moon and the sun and the shape and configuration and direction of constellations, um, other atmospheric phenomena. Uh, sun dogs, for example, and that's part of the that's part of the um, uh, part of the package. I, I think package is a good word. Part of the package. The and but it's not because it's an oral tradition. It's not organized, so I can't say. Oh, yes, we have. 37 lunar omens which refer to this particular topic and they're found on page 76 of this particular book. And I, 
bring that up because this is exactly where this material interfaces with what I spent most of my academic life doing, which is looking at Babylonian material. Because if you ask that question about Babylonian material, I can tell you that we have a series called Enuma Anu Enlil, which was um, collected and compiled over 2,000 years, which reached 70 tablets of about a few hundred omens per tablet in its final form, for which we have catalogs, commentaries, and um, other types of texts. So what, you, what we have are almost mirror images. We have a organized written canonical tradition on one side in Babylonia, or for the Hebrew Bible, for the New Testament, for Quran, for all these types of authoritative works. But when you're dealing with the Gwich'in material, we're dealing with an oral tradition, and this oral tradition never reached a point of having any kind of single authority which could say, yes, this goes in, this is the official boy in the moon story, and this goes out. That doesn't exist. What we have are these different layers of story and tradition and packaging, and there's, not, there's no, one can't say this is more genuine than that, than that. Even if it's the same person telling the story two different times, I heard different stories with different elements and different versions from the same informants. George Semple told me the story twice, more than twice, but one time the story had two dogs and the other times the story had one dog. It doesn't mean he was wrong when he was telling me two dogs, but he, that was the version of the story at that moment. My only excuse for taking, his, taking the stories and putting them in a cage is that due to the onslaught of modern Western civilization, these living traditions are, are, are going and they're going fast. And if we don't at least collect everything that we can collect, they're, they're going to be gone. Thank you. <laughs>